Good morning. I hope you are enjoying your couch this morning. Thanks for tuning in. Uh, thank you for allowing Arcade Church to bring truth directly into your living room. Uh, it's kind of crazy the, what we're walking through right now, but at the same time, it's really kind of neat when we think about it. It is such a blessing to think about how each individual family right now is like leaning into their TV, into their computer, into their phone uh, to watch the word of God come, to watch truth come into their hearts, into their lives, to worship together as one around all of Sacramento, around all of maybe even the country, uh, are getting together this morning to say, hey, we believe that God is true and real, and we believe that our Cade Church is more than a building. It is us. We are his church. We are his people. And how cool is it that we get to jump into his word together this morning and be a beautiful and wonderful picture that is the body of Christ, every joint and ligament working together to bring and understand and pursue Christ. What a joy. Thanks for being with us this morning. We're going to continue our series. We've called it, He Said What? I don't think that's what we actually called it, but that's what I like to call it because I'm in high school ministry. Uh, And we have been looking together at some different statements that Jesus made that are challenging statements. And before all this coronavirus stuff, uh, I was at the gym and I was playing pickleball with some friends. And my wife and I both were there enjoying a game of pickleball together. And we were, of course, we brought our three kids because we were going to both be at the gym together. And we were allowing our kids to just kind of wander and play in the, in the area around. There's like a big green field and there's a playground. And our kids were doing that. They played pickleball for a little while in one of the extra courts. And then they were running around on the green field. And then when they were done with that, they were playing on the playground and having a great time. And at one point in our, in our morning, the kids came over and to the side of the pickleball court is a fence that's maybe 15 feet high. And my eldest decided, I'm going to climb that fence, right? And so he starts climbing this 15-foot high fence, you know? And I see him doing it. He gets about halfway up there. And I remember looking right at him and going, hey, bud, don't die, <laughs> you know? Like, that's it. Don't, just don't die, you know? And, and that's kind of how it has been in our family. Always the rule has been in the Morlet household. Hey, if you're going to climb something high, make sure you can get yourself down. Like, that's the rule. Don't go up unless you can get yourself down. And other than that, like, hey, we're going to let you. We're going to let you learn and grow, and we're going to let you do this. So he gets to the top of the fence, right? And he's hanging out up there just watching us play pickleball. And it's about that moment. He's been up there for maybe a minute, and he's watching us play pickleball. And someone comes out of the pool area in the gym, and they're yelling at him, get down from there right now, right? And I'm like, whoa. And so I look up at him. I go, oh, busted. Time to get down, <laughs> you know? And so he gets down. And that's kind of the end of it. And, and it, was, it was this kind of hilarious thing. It's hilarious and interesting how different people have different opinions on what is safe and what is right, you know? It's quite possible that for many of you listening to the story, you thought immediately, oh my gosh, he let his kid climb a 15-foot fence. What is wrong with this guy? You know, and you immediately started to think about your parenting style and and what might be safe and what might not be safe. And for many of you, maybe it immediately brought you to a memory of your childhood. And in that memory of your childhood, you were thinking, oh, yeah, I remember climbing big fences and trees. I remember that one time I fell out of a tree and broke my arm. I remember that all the times I got to climb all those things and I never got hurt. I remember climbing big things and I remember being safe and 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 being okay. It's interesting how each one of us has kind of our own understanding of what is right uh, when it comes to parenting and when it comes to many other things in the world. This morning, we're going to be in Luke chapter 12. So so where where you're at, I would love for you to get out your Bible, get out your device, and turn to Luke chapter 12. And as we're doing that, I'm just going to pray for us this morning. Father, we thank you so much that we get to get into your word today. God, we thank you so much that you are real and true, and in the midst of our living room, we can come together as your body, the church, and we can understand your truth, and we can apply it to our lives. Lord, this morning, would you speak not my words, but yours alone, and would you open up our hearts today to hear your truth and to allow it to shape how we live our lives. God, we thank you, and we lift you up in your name. Amen. Our passage this morning, it comes in the middle of a group of Jesus' teachings. And and just before our passage, we get this little glimpse of of what is known to us now as Jesus' second coming. And he's he's talking to his disciples, and he's talking to anyone who's listening, and he's saying, hey, you need to be ready for this, and here's some of the ways you can get ready for this. And then right after this kind of talk with him together about this, he moves us into verse 49, where we're going to begin this morning. In Luke chapter 12, verse 49, he says, I came to cast fire on the earth. And would that it were already kindled. 
it's like right off the bat, we're going to start out with a hard saying of Jesus. We're going to start out with, with something that's kind of challenging. Well, uh, uh, he said what kind of moment, right? Because he begins the passage that we're, we're looking at today. And it says, I came to cast fire on the earth and would that it were already kindled. And we, and we hear that and we go, whoa. He's going he's gonna to cast fire. He, and, and not only is he going to cast fire, but there's this, there's this kind of seeming desire that it were already kindled, that the fire had already begun, that the, that the fire would already be there. And that's not even our hard passage for the morning. That's just the passage that's going to lead us into our hard passage this morning. But he begins with this. There, I came to cast fire on the earth and would that it would already be kindled. And it's really challenging for us because we know that elsewhere in the scripture, elsewhere even in this very book, in, in the book of Luke, we know that Jesus talks about how he came to save the lost, how he came to heal the broken, how he came to bring joy and peace. And now here he says, I've come to cast fire on the earth. I came to bring judgment. Many have read this verse to mean that Jesus is going to come and he's going to bring fires of judgment to destroy. And many have read this verse and they've, they've thought that Jesus is going to come and he's going to, bring, he's going to bring fires to purify, that he's going to bring fires to, to take, to burn away what doesn't belong in us and keep only what does belong in it. And it's very possible that when Jesus says this, he's saying both. He's saying that I came to bring fire of judgment for the unjust and I can come to bring purifying fire for the just, that both of these things are going to happen in my coming, that both of these things are true about why I've come, that I've come to both bring judgment to those who choose not to follow God, and I come to bring uh, purification to those who choose to follow God. And it's really interesting because it, it should bring great joy in our hearts as we read the next verse. Because in the next verse, in verse 50, Jesus says this, I have a baptism to be baptized with, and how great is my distress until it is accomplished. Uh, there, just not that long ago, I heard that the gym that I usually go to was going to close down for a time. And, and in me, there was this immediate satisfaction, right? There was, yes. Whew, now I don't have to go to the gym. You know? I really don't enjoy going to the gym. And, and when it's time for me to go to the gym, and I'm going to go to the gym because I need to get, you can't see the belly right now because the, the table is blocking it, thankfully. But I have a belly I need to get rid of that I need, to, I need to handle. And so I need to go to the gym. It's important for me to go to the gym in order to stay healthy, in order to continue to do the things that I want to do. But every time I'm going to go to the gym, I dread it. I like, I like live hours in anguish, right? I'm just like, oh, I don't want to go to the gym. Like I don't want to head there. I don't want to get on the bike. I don't want to do the extra exercises. I don't want to do my, you know, all my strengthening and all the stuff because it's going to be hard and it's going to hurt. I'm going to be sore for days after and it's just not going to be an enjoyable time. And so I think forward to the gym in anguish and, and that is not even close not even comparably close to what is going on in our passage here. But I want us to get in this mindset of understanding that when Jesus says, I have a baptism to be baptized with, how great is my distress until it is accomplished, he's talking about something that is going to happen, and he's talking about something that is not going to be fun. He's talking about something that's going to be lots of pain and anguish. It's going to be very, very difficult, much, much worse than, the, than me going to the gym. Jesus is saying there's this thing coming up. And for those of us who've, who've gotten to the back of the book and we've read the end of the story, we know what he's talking about. He's saying that I'm about to die and I'm about to be raised to life. This is the baptism that Jesus is talking about. He's talking to people right in the day where John the Baptist has been baptizing people in repentance, where they kind of come and they die to their sins and they come out and decide to live a different life. And so people know exactly what he's saying. He's saying something about a death and a resurrection, something about going under and coming back up. And so when Jesus says, I have a baptism, what he's talking about, he's saying, I'm about to die, and then I'm going to be raised to life. That is what is about to happen. I'm about to go to the cross, and I'm about to go to the cross for my people. I'm about to go to the cross for a reason. Now, I recognize that my suffering at the gym is an incredibly poor illustration, but I want us to understand what is going on in Jesus' mind at this moment. He's saying, I'm about to go through something that's going to be painful, that's going to be difficult. The same thoughts that I have when I'm going to the gym. I'm going to go through something that's going to be painful and going to be difficult, something that I'm not going to enjoy, something that I don't want to do. But the end result of my suffering at the gym is hopefully going to be less of a belly, is hopefully going to be more of the ability to do the things that I love, to play the sports that I love, to live this 
this life on earth with my family longer. It's hopefully going to be all these wonderful results that are going to come from me going to the gym. And that's exactly what's going on in Jesus' mind. It is far more suffering. It is far greater loss. Jesus is going to go to the cross and die. He's going to bear the sin of the world on his shoulders. And he says, this baptism is coming. And I think of it daily in anguish. I think of the pain and the difficulty that I'm about to walk through. And I don't like it. But his distress in the moment, as Hebrews chapter 12 describes it, is for the joy set before him. In Hebrews chapter 12, we hear that that Jesus goes to the cross for the joy set before him. It says that, that he goes there enduring its shame, despising the cross itself, because he knows that the end result of the cross is going to be freedom for you and I. The end result of the cross is going to be relationship with his people. The end result of the cross is going to be for us life. And so he says, I'm going to go to the cross, and I'm going to go to the cross to bring life to those who would follow me. I'm going to go to the cross, and even though it's going to be anguish and pain and difficulty and death literally for him, he says the end result of that is going to be joy. The end result of that is going to be my people having a way and having freedom. And so he says, I'm going to the cross. And for us, when he says that statement about being baptized in his anguish, it should be for us joy. For us, a welling of joy within us to go, wow, he did that. He went to the cross. He did that for me. He did that for you. He did that that we may have life and have it eternal. What a joy it is that Jesus was looking forward in anguish to the baptism of death and resurrection that he was going to partake on our behalf. And this leads us into our statement this morning. This leads us into our hard saying of Jesus. In verse 51, he says, do you think that I have come to give peace on earth? No, I tell you, but rather division. It's a tough statement. Jesus himself, who has been described as the Prince of Peace, he says, do you think that I've come to bring peace on earth? I have not come for that. I've come to bring division. You hear a statement like that and you go, wait, what? right? Like what happened to peace on earth and goodwill towards men? That was the same very book. In Luke chapter 2, the angels, they came out and they said, peace on earth and goodwill towards men. And have we just thrown that peace out the window? Have we said, now you say I come not to bring peace, but to bring division? How can it be, Jesus, that you both want to bring bring peace and you want to bring division? In Luke chapter 2, you would say bring peace. And in Luke chapter 12, you would say, I want to bring division. What is happening in this passage that seems to be so contradictory from what we understand to be true about who Jesus is and about what Jesus' ministry on earth is. I think the context of Luke chapter 2 is very helpful for us in this. In Luke chapter 2, verse 14, is when the angels say this, Fear not, I'm sorry, verse uh, 10, it says, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior who is Christ the Lord. The angels come and they proclaim in verse 10 and 11 that a Savior is coming, that this Savior has come, and he's come for all people. And that's in verse 14, just two verses later, when we hear that he come to bring peace on earth and goodwill towards men. That what he's bringing is peace and goodwill towards man. And we have to ask ourselves this question, where is that peace? Who is that peace for? The peace and the goodwill that Jesus brings, is it for men, between men, Or is it between God and man? You see, because what Jesus is doing is he's coming to save. He's coming to bring goodwill and peace where there currently is no goodwill or peace. And to understand that, I think we go to James chapter 4, right? In James chapter 4, it says this in verse 1. What causes quarrels and what causes fights among you? Is it not that your passions are at war within you? You desire and do not have, so you murder. You covet and cannot obtain, so you fight and quarrel. You do not have because you do not ask. You ask and do not receive because you ask wrongly to spend it on your passions. You adulterous people, do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity toward God? Therefore, whoever wishes to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. So as we begin to understand the context of Scripture and we begin to understand the context of Luke chapter 2, what's happening is the angels have come and they said, guess what? All of mankind is currently at war with God. 
All of mankind currently has no goodwill between them and God. All of mankind currently is an enemy of the God of this world, the God of all creation. And then it says, let us rejoice, the angels. They say, let us rejoice and be glad. Why? Because Jesus has come to take this brokenness, this enmity between me and God, this this lack of peace between the king of all the universe and between me and, and this lack of goodwill between God and man and to fix it. He's come to bring peace. He's come to take what is broken and make it right. He's come so that God and I will no longer be enemies, but we will be at peace. And this is what we understand as we begin to study the scripture, we begin to understand what's happening in Luke. We understand that Jesus came to take what was broken between God and man and bring it to peace. That we who were not at peace with God now are at peace with God of the all creation. Those who believe in Jesus and because of his death and resurrection on the cross, because of what he has done, the baptism he's talking about, because of that, we who were not at peace can be at peace with God. And so then we read our passage today and we see, okay, do you think that I have come in Luke chapter 12 to give peace on earth? No, I tell you, but rather division. In verse 52, it says, for from now on in one house, there will be five divided, three against two and two against three. They will be divided father against son and son against father, mother against daughter and daughter against mother, mother mother-in-law against her daughter-in-law and daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. The division that Jesus is promising here is not division between God and man. The division that Jesus is promising here is division between man and man. Jesus says there's a division that is coming between these people, men, not men and God, Because Jesus came to bring peace between man and God. But what Jesus is doing is going to bring division between man and man. We read that in John chapter 15. He echoes words almost exactly like this in verse 18. He says, if the world hates you, know that it has hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love you as its own. But because you are not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. Remember the world Remember the word that I said to you, a servant is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will also persecute you. If they kept my word, they will also keep yours. Now get this. If I were to stand here right now and tell you the only true way to raise a child is to allow him to climb as high as he will, is to allow him to fall sometimes and get hurt, is to allow him to go up as high as he will, and if he falls, he'll learn from that fall. Many of you would say, that's not true. Many of you would, would maybe even vehemently stand up and say, no, my job is to protect my child. My job is to make sure my child only gets six feet high because if he goes any higher than that, he might break his neck. He might hurt himself. This might happen. That might happen. And many of you might say, yes, here, here, I agree. We got to let kids live the life they're going to live. And we, we got to let them do it how they're going to do it. And, and we would have divided house. We would have divided people, some people saying, yes, that's how it should be, and some people saying, no, that's not how it should be. And i got to tell you, honestly, (laughs) the reality is I have no idea which way is the right way to parent. I have no idea if they're both the right way to parent, if somehow they both work together in concert, like I should let the kid climb up as high as he can, but I should be right there at the bottom of the fence in case he falls, ready ready to catch him. You know, I'm not exactly sure exactly what the right way to parent is, but I know that if I were to stand hard for the right way to parent, there would certainly be people standing hard on the other side. If I were to say to you right here, did you know that two plus two equals seven? You would look at me. You would assume that I was joking. You would assume that I was pulling your leg. You would assume that I was messing with you. But if I were to, but if I were to vehemently argue that two plus two equals seven, and I were to tell you this is absolute truth, two plus two definitely equals seven, and I were to get out a whiteboard and start trying to prove to you mathematically why two plus two equals seven, and if I were to start to build a following of people who all agreed that two plus two equals seven, and I were to start saying, hey, we are the two plus two equals seven crew, and I were to start moving around the world and gaining more and more followers, I can guarantee you that eventually as we grew in our following of two plus two equals 
Chronicles 7, there would be a mass of people who would stand up and say, hey, you guys are all out of your minds because two plus two obviously equals four. And we know that to be true. And so because two sides both were claiming absolute truth, both these sides would be butting heads over and over again saying, we know what is true and we know what is right. And so we're going to stand in the middle for truth and the two plus two plus seven crew, you are totally wrong. And the two plus two plus seven crew would say two plus two equals four crew, you are totally wrong. And all the while there would be, there would be families breaking apart, right? There would, be, there would be best friends who are breaking apart because one best friend says seven and one says four and they would just be clashing over and over again. And so Jesus said these words thousands of years ago and how applicable these words are today in a time where the absolute has become obsolete. Let me say it again. In a day where the absolute has become obsolete, the day we live in today is a day that says what you believe is right is right and what I believe is right is right and what they believe is right is right and what they believe is right is right and everyone can have their own interpretation of what is right. Everyone can have their own interpretation of what is true as long as, get this, we live in peace with one another. As long as we're pals, as long as we live in peace with one another, you can believe what you want and I'll believe what I want and it's okay. The hard part about that is simply this, two plus two equals four. Truth is truth no matter what I believe about it, it is still truth. So when Jesus shows up in John chapter 14, and he says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And nobody comes to the Father except through me. When he says, I am the only truth, I am the absolute truth, I am the only way, I am the absolute way, I am the only life, I am the absolute life. In fact, nobody can get to the Father except through this path. This is the only path. It's like Jesus himself climbed to the top of the fence and he hung out at the top of the fence and he cried out, this is it. This is the way it's done. This is the way it's laid out. And anyone who came out and yelled at him, get down from that fence, he said, there's no way because I'm doing exactly what I'm supposed to be doing. I'm teaching truth exactly the way truth is. I am telling you that I am the way, the truth, and the life. And if he stands and he says, this is the only way, the only truth, the only life, if he refuses to coexist in truth with those around him, if he refuses to share truth with those around him and says, no, this is the way, this is the truth, this is the life, there is no other, I tell you, there is going to be division between man and man. There are going to be mothers who deny sons. There are going to be fathers who deny daughters. There are going to be brothers who deny sisters. There are going to be best friends who deny best friends. It is going to break apart relationships between man and man. It will cause nations to divide. But one thing it will do is this truth will bring peace between God and man. It will bring peace between those who are at enmity with God and those who want to have have relationship with God. It will bring peace between God and man, even as it brings division between man and man. Because as long as the world and the people in it want truth to be whatever they deem it to be, the truth, the real truth, will cause division. As long as the world does not agree on what truth is, it will cause division. But no matter, no matter how divisive it is, the truth is still the truth. We cannot simply coexist. And this is exactly what Jesus is saying in this passage. He's saying fire is coming and I'm going to die for the truth. Those were his two opening statements. Fire is coming and I'm going to die for the truth. And my death is the way, the truth, and the life. My death is the only way that you or anyone else can have peace with God. My death is the only way that the division that we live in between us and God can be made right. It is the only way that true peace comes between God and man. It's the only way. So we must refuse to coexist to refuse to err on the side of making friends, to refuse to stand for anything but the truth, for anything but Christ alone. I remember having a conversation with someone one time. And we were sitting down and we were talking about the Bible and we were talking about uh, a sermon that I had preached on truth, a sermon that I had preached about a particular difficult truth. And I remember this person saying to me, hey, you can't be so black and white when it comes to teaching truth that we live in a culture today where things aren't so black and white. And so, so you can't stand for truth quite so 
truthfully. And I remember in the midst of that conversation, trying to get to the heart of where they were coming from. And we finally got to this moment where they said this statement. They said, if it says it in the scripture and I don't like it, I assume it's not true. And I, I was struck wordless for a moment. And then I said to them, well, we'll just have to agree to disagree on that. And I've come back to that conversation over and over and over again, every time wondering if I, if I said the right thing. If I should have said, we'll just have to agree to disagree on that, or if I should have said, hey, guess what? Truth is truth. Truth is truth. It's not gonna change based on what I feel about it. It's not gonna change on what I like and don't like about it. It's not gonna change on how I feel about two plus two equal four. If I feel vehemently just ticked off about two plus two equaling four, guess what? It's still four. It doesn't change. And so no matter what I believe about the truth of God, the truth of God is the truth, no matter what I believe about it. And the things that Jesus said are the truth, no matter, no matter how hard they are to handle, no matter how hard they are to swallow, no matter how difficult it is for me to get behind them, they are the truth. And so I think maybe I said the wrong thing when I said we'll have to agree to disagree. I think maybe because I was so worried about having a relationship with someone, I let the truth die because I was so worried about there not being division between me and this person, I made a way for there to be division between that person and God. I said, okay, it's better for you and God to be divided than for you and me to be divided. And let me tell you this morning, church, that is not the truth. It is so much better for us to be in relationship with God than in relationship with one another. So if our relationship with one another is going to cost our relationship with God, we've done something wrong. If I begin to put my relationship with other people between their relationship with God, then I have failed as a follower of Jesus. And that's exactly what Jesus says in Luke chapter 12. He says, guess what? Truth is truth and it will cause division. He says, people following me will have to walk away from relationship with man. It will hurt the relationship they have with one another. It is difficult to stand for truth and not everyone's gonna do it. And so it's going to cause division. But it will bring peace between me and God. It will bring peace between you and God. Anyone who believes and understands Jesus will find themselves at peace with God, even if they are not at peace with man. I think we get to a point like this and we have to ask this question, how do I live this out, right? Because you get this picture that maybe I'm supposed to run around with my Bible knocking people over the head going, hey, you need to believe in Jesus, right? Hey, you know, here's the truth, here's the truth, here's the truth. Open your mouth so I can shove it down your throat, right? And that is the approach that many believers who are standing for truth take. We say, I've gotta, I've gotta take this and I've gotta just, just dig it in there, believe in Jesus or perish. But I, I want you to notice something. In Jesus's ministry, it was usually not the lost who hated him. We have to notice this. We have to recognize this. That as Jesus moved around and did ministry, his message was always like the message for the woman caught in adultery in John chapter eight. In the midst of her sin, in the midst of her brokenness, in the midst of her enmity between him and herself, in the midst of what she had done that was causing her to be at, not at peace with God, Jesus shows up and he says, no one's gonna throw a stone here. No one's gonna cast judgment here. No one's gonna bring the fire in this moment. And it's not until the very end of the interaction with her. It's not until after he's already saved her from the people who are trying to kill her. It's not until after he's already told her, I'm not going to condemn you. And, and we've already had this wonderful moment of truth and peace where Jesus says, hey, I'm gonna bring peace between you and God instead of fire, instead of judgment, instead of division. I'm gonna bring peace between you and God. And at that moment, Jesus says to her, now go and leave your life of sin. Isn't it amazing that when Jesus teaches truth, he teaches it from the, that perspective of I came to bring peace between God and man. 
I came to bring healing between God and man. And that, that's my goal and that's my objective. And that's my goal and my objective. It should be your goal and your objective that in our interactions with the outside world, in our interactions with people that are, that are, that are inside the church and outside of the church, we start from a place of our objective and our goal is that you may be at peace with God is that by the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ, you may be at peace with God. Your sin that is causing you to be separated from him for, for now and for eternity, we want that to be dealt with by his blood. We don't expect you to deal with it. No, we expect that Jesus himself has come to bring peace between you and God. And that might cause division in your relationships at home. That might cause division in your relationships at work, in your relationship with your friends, in your relationship with your government, who knows. That might cause division all around your life, but it is more important for you to be at peace with God than to be at peace with man. But can we just make sure, church, that when we live this out, it is a message of peace and not of division. A message like the angel that says, behold, the Savior has come to bring peace between God and man. If man hates us for sharing the truth, if they hate us for standing up for what is good and what is right, let's make sure they hate us for the right reasons. Not because we treated them poorly, not because we didn't love them like Jesus, but they hate us because we stood for light in the midst of darkness, because we stood for truth in the midst of untruth, because we stood for what's right in the midst of a world that is lost in what's wrong. Can we make sure, church, that anyone who hates me hates me because of Jesus, not because of me? Because of the words of Christ, not because of my actions. The only reason they can have to hate me is because of what I've spoken in truth, not because of what I've done to them, not because of what I've said against them, not because of how I've judged them or I've hurt them. So for us, the way we respond to truth is twofold, I think. Number one, we go out into the world and we share a message of peace because that is the truth, that Jesus came to bring peace between God and man. And we continue to share a message of peace with the lost, a message that says Jesus came that you may have life and have it abundantly, so come to him and then we'll worry about sin. And I think the second part of that is that we live the truth. We stand for the truth. We don't compromise on the truth, that we get in the word and we understand what it says and we read it and we memorize it and we take it with us everywhere we go so that when untruth comes into our lives, we can say, no, that's not the truth. Two plus two still equals four. Jesus is the savior of all mankind and he is God in the flesh and he came to bring life to the world, to you and to me. And so please, would you accept this morning that we must stand for truth and the truth that we stand for is that God came to bring peace between God and man and that that might cause division between man and man. And even when it does, we continue to stand up for what's right, for who is right, but we do it the way Jesus did with the love of Christ showing to all. Lord, we thank you for your truth. God, a truth that we can live on, a truth that we can understand, a truth that we can, we can set our whole lives upon. God, we pray that in those moments when it's hard to stand for truth, that you help us to do just that. God, in those moments where it's hard to, to say, hey, I know what's right and I'm gonna live for what's right and I'm gonna act on what's right and I'm gonna do what's right, Lord, that you would help us by your spirit to do just that in each and every one of those moments. And Lord, we also pray for a heart of compassion and love for those who are lost, who don't know the truth. That a message from us to them would be a message that says God wants to be at peace with you and so he sent Jesus to die for you and we can worry about all the rest when you believe that truth. Thank you for today. Thank you for this moment in your name. Amen. Thanks for watching. Find out more about the Arcade Church community at arcadechurch.com.